Hello and welcome to this video on an approximate version of the Raman effect in nonlinear fiber optics. This video was inspired by this comment by one of my viewers who asked if it's always necessary to have a femtosecond time step in order to correctly capture the impact of Raman on a pulse propagating through a fiber. And the short answer is that, in fact, it's not always necessary if you're willing to accept using an approximation. So that's what we're going to look into today. Now, you may have seen these two expressions for the impact of the Raman effect. The first one is the one I presented in a previous video, which is a convolution between the power of the pulse at different times in the past with a total response function right here. And the other version is the approximation, which includes simply a gradient. So you might be a bit surprised that you can replace a convolution with a gradient and almost get the same result. After all, these are two very different mathematical operations. But let's take a look at how we can get from the expression up here to the one down here. First of all, let us review this convolution expression right here. Essentially, this expression is saying that if you want the impact of the Raman effect on some part of a pulse here at uh, zero exactly, then we need to integrate over all the different powers that are present in the past and the product with some Raman or some total response function right here. And um, as we can see, the total um, multiplication here is just the area of this purple curve like so. And note that we need a convolution in this case because the, let's say the duration of the pulse is very similar to the duration of the Raman response function. So we have to actually look at exactly what kind of power was present at an exact time in the past in order to get the correct result. But now we're going to assume that the second derivative of this power function here is quite small, or in other words, that the duration of the pulse is much larger than the duration of the response function, like so. So what happens in this case? Well, we can notice that um, at this point, the power at different times in the past can just be linearly extrapolated from the present power and the current derivative. Now note that, of course, as we go further and further into the past, the discrepancy between the actual pulse power marked here in red and the approximation is going to increase. But fortunately, the response function will also tend to decrease quite quickly for larger times. So overall, this discrepancy doesn't end up mattering very much. So again, we simply linearly extrapolate the power into the past and then do the integral that way. We can of course notice that the integral of the total response function here should just be one. And um, if we apply that fact to the convolution here, we can see that the constant term like so simply jumps out and the derivative term doesn't even depend on the time delay, which is what we're integrating over. That can also be moved outside of the, the integral. And um, next we can simplify this a bit further by taking a look at the remaining integral right here. Now, if you plug in the total response function, it includes both an instantaneous part that describes how the electrons respond to the very strong applied field and a delayed response, which essentially is the, the Raman response. And then of course, we can notice that the instantaneous response will simply integrate to zero because of this delta function and the fact that we're multiplying by the time delay directly. So if we simply neglect that term, we can see we're left with this expression right here. And um, if we take a look at this integral now, it actually is kind of interesting because basically it is the average duration of the Raman response function scaled by the relative Raman contribution. And typically this whole thing will have a value on the scale of one to 10 femtoseconds, depending on the exact value of FR and the exact nature of the Raman response function. But for a lot of uh, classes that you might encounter, this is gonna be the, the range we're, we're interested in. Okay, so if we plug all of this back into the expression for the generalized nonlinear Schrodinger equation, or at least the nonlinear contribution to it, we can see that we get this expression right here instead of the convolution from before. Now if you multiply this whole bracket into this other bracket right here with the instantaneous term and the self-steepening term, we can see that we get the instantaneous part right here and then the uh, derivative of this whole thing over here. But note that we're actually kind of applying the derivative twice in this case to this one. You can see it already has a derivative here. We apply one more. And so we've already assumed that the second derivative is small and subsequently we can also assume that the square of the first derivative is very small, allowing us to neglect this term here and leaving us with this expression here for the evolution of the field subject to nonlinearity, self-steepening and the Raman effect. Okay, so let's actually take a look at how this approximation impacts the evolution of a pulse compared to the exact version. So here I've simply taken a simulation of the pulse propagating through a medium where only self-phase modulation is present. So this is going to be sort of our baseline version. And we can see that we get symmetric broadening as we expect. But now I'm going to activate 
the exact Raman response. And you can see that if you switch back and forth, it does change the spectrum a little bit. You can see generally the lower frequencies will have higher power than the uh, higher frequencies. And that is to be expected from the Raman effect because we know that it will tend to redshift the spectrum. So let's just switch back and forth a few more times so we can see that. And now let's try and compare the exact implementation to the approximate implementation, like so. So you can see that there's definitely a difference in the way that the spectrum looks for this particular choice of parameters. But we still managed to capture the overall effect that the red frequencies are more intense than the blue frequencies. You can probably see that even if I go back to the um, approximate case here, all the red ones are slightly more intense than all of the blue ones. So it is kind of interesting that we can capture some of the same dynamics, even though we're replacing a convolution with a derivative. Now, it still raises the question why we would even use the approximation when, after all, you'd think the exact implementation is more interesting because it is always exact. Well, it actually comes down to a few advantages. Um, first of all, let's think about how long it takes to take a step in the split step Fourier method. That method involves doing a Fourier transform of the nonlinear operator applied to the field in the time domain and then applying the dispersion and for that matter also loss and then doing the inverse Fourier transform to go back to the time domain. So in other words, we need two Fourier transforms to take a single step in the baseline case where we only have self phase modulation. But if we look at the convolution operation here in the case where we include Raman, we can see that it's now going to cost us three more Fourier transforms. And the reason is that a convolution is essentially the same as, well, let's say a convolution between two functions in the time domain is the same as computing the Fourier transforms of those two functions individually, multiplying the result, and then taking the inverse Fourier transform of that whole thing. So in other words, we basically add another three Fourier transforms in order to do this convolution. So we have still have two for the basic step, but then an additional three if you want to model the Raman effect exactly. However, if we use the approximation, we can see that we now just have to do another gradient and a gradient is a much more uh, cheap operation to do uh, computationally compared to three additional Fourier transforms. And again, since Fourier transforms are the most computationally expensive um, step involved in the split step method, um, we expect this to be quite a lot slower than the, uh, either the baseline version or the one where we have the approximate Raman effect since it just involves a gradient. And of course, I decided to also check this experimentally. So I ran both the basic version here and the approximate version, as you see in blue and green, they're almost the same time duration. And I also ran the exact Raman implementation for the same simulation. And we can see that it's quite a bit slower, uh, around uh, three times more slow in, um, on average. And of course, that's to be expected because if we have five uh, Fourier transforms, when we use the exact Raman convolution, and we divide that by the two we need for the, the baseline case, we expect the um, exact one to be around 2.5 times slower Again, the present case, it seems to be more like three times, but it's still sort of in the right, the right neighborhood. All right, so what's, uh, what's sort of the practical use case for this Raman approximation? Um, so first of all, as I mentioned before, it's uh, valid when the pulse duration is larger than the Raman response time. And again, that happens when um, you maybe have a pulse from the scale of, let's say, 100 picoseconds to maybe one picosecond, um, because if you go beyond that, Raman's gonna be quite uh, negligible anyway, so you might as well just like drop it and not, not include it at all. But um, I think the um, another advantage is that it actually, using this approximation, allows you to um, use larger time steps and still capture the impact of the Raman effect. So you don't have to use a femtosecond step. You can maybe use like 10 femtoseconds, maybe even a few tenths of femtoseconds to still get a good performance and also capture the um, impact of Raman, at least approximately. But in terms of sort of, let's say, the workflow of your use of simulation tools, I think using the approximation is very handy when you are just in the process of playing around with the parameters of the simulation and finding which ones sort of uh, match your requirements. For example, let's imagine that I've been tasked with determining for which um, peak pulse power the spectrum of the pulse uh, ends up stretching from all the way from 240 terahertz to 330 here. So what, what power do I need for that to happen? Well, um, if I include the Raman effect here, I can simply use the approximate version to get an estimate of when I reach that amount of broadening and then I can use the exact version afterwards. So for example, going from one watt to two watt here, you know, doing another simulation, is gonna cost me around three and a half seconds, at least on my PC, if I use the approximate version. So another three and a half seconds here, another three and a half, another three and a half, and another three and a half, another three and a half. And now you can see that I'm sort of close to the range where I expect the entire spectrum to be filled out. And then I can run the exact version of the Raman effect to see the precise answer in the end. And the point is that if I take this approach of first using the approximation and then using the precise version in the end, 
it will take me 32 seconds because I did three, uh, rather six approximate simulations and then one exact one, giving me a total um, time spent simulating of 32 seconds. But if I'd always used the exact version of the Raman effect, then this would have taken me essentially uh, 66 seconds, around twice as long. And of course, a difference of 30 seconds doesn't seem like very much right now. But if you run a very big project with many different simulations, um, this can actually add up to quite a lot of save time in the end, and also a lot of, um, I guess, saved mental energy on your part, not having to wait around for a simulation to, to finish. So I hope you found this video on the approximate Raman effect interesting. Feel free to check out some of my other work over here, and stay tuned for more. Bye-bye.